In this video, I'm putting a 1989 Skoda Estelle II 120L for its paces. This should be fun. I used to own a 105 Lux in exactly this shade of green. So the rear engine Skoda story starts in the 1960s. Uh, the 1000 was the earliest model and it gently evolved into the Estelle of 1976. Uh, the Estelle then evolved um, through into the 1980s but this is the larger engine one it's the 120L it's a five because it's got the five speed gearbox they're so proud of this fact it says five speed there and five here but if we come in a little lower we've got the Estelle 2 because this is the um, the facelift of the Estelle uh, which came in the um, mid 1980s but yeah famously rear engined and famously a, a bit of a joke car I, I think uh, especially in Britain, purely because we're so class-based and if all you could afford was a Skoda, then you deserve to be a laughing stock, which is hugely unfair. These are very capable cars. They had a superb dealer network and won their class in rallying for 17 years on the trot. So they deserve a lot more respect. So engine at the back and then a fairly conventional seating arrangement you could also get the rapid which uh, i tested many years ago said to be the last um, rear engine skoda built that one uh, which has a nice sort of coupe sort of back on it but very impractical because some of your engine access is through the back seat so uh, at least we have doors here to gain access to the rear the the coupes are a bit more of a fiddle to work on and we've got a boot at the front so um, let's see what else is stored here at the front so the frunk is accessed by pulling a safety catch there and you'll note it's opening in a rather unusual direction. And then we've got a safety catch there, and this is how you gain access. There aren't many cars that have a sideways opening bonnet, but the Skoda is one. A problem for the UK, because you're loading from the curb and uh, you can't actually access it. I've entirely forgotten what this handle is. What is that handle for? Their wheel is stored there, so I've just released it from its cradle. So um, I'd better put that back in place. <coughs> That's what curiosity does, folks. It gets the better of you. There we go. So yeah, a usable amount of space here for your shopping and uh, the brake master cylinder here, wiper motor here. There is also a bit of storage space in the back. If I tip the seat forward, uh, there's a little area here which holds the jack and the wheel brace and you lift some of this padding out for better engine access and access to the gearbox, which is kind of directly beneath here. So uh, hidden storage. A little safety catch here, opens up the uh, engine cover. And uh, here is the engine, a 1.2 litre four cylinder engine, bizarrely an aluminium block with a cast iron head. That's the way Skoda was still doing things then. So slightly unusual, but classic push rod design. I see he's got spark right electronic ignition on it but yeah socialist speed shop feel the power now at this point i'll um, point your attention towards the cooling pipe which runs all the way to the front of the vehicle so it is a front mounted radiator when the the rear engine skodas first came out in the 1960s they had the radiator at the back but they um, soon discovered that uh, it's far better to have the radiator in the main airflow at the front of the vehicle so very long coolant pipes but then you've got you've got to get coolant down to the front because you need the heater to demist your windscreen. So perhaps not too dissimilar from the 60s cars after all. But it's a very hardy little engine. They can do head gaskets. This one did one fairly recently, but it's an absolute piece of cake to do because it's a simple push rod engine. You know, the, 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 these are cars designed in um, communist countries. So um, they were always designed to be very simple, very easy to work on. Now, rear engine cars often come in for a lot of criticism for the handling and the, the Skodas were no exceptional. They gained quite the reputation. It's a very simple swing axle design because the car was designed to be cheap and light, which is why they went for the rear engine. So you haven't got to worry about trying to make the drive shafts twist as you would in a front wheel drive car. And you haven't got to worry about a great long prop shaft for a front engine rear wheel drive car. So it, it, there's a reason manufacturers went for rear engines and in the 1960s a lot of manufacturers did the hillman imp simca thousand fiat loads of fiats had rear engines volkswagen beetle of course by the 1980s that was becoming a bit of an anachronism and i think one of the issues is that generation of drivers weren't necessarily used 
to uh, rear engines. You, you have to be a bit more careful, especially wet roads. Um, and uh, you have to watch out for lift off oversteer very much because you've got very simple steer suspension geometry on a swing axle. Effectively, it, you've just got the drive shaft coming in and the wheel is just going like this. So you can get massive positive camber going into negative camber. And uh, it just means the handling characteristics can be unusual. That was addressed with the 130 and the 136 versions of the uh, Skodas. Uh, where they actually developed a semi-trailing arm rear suspension, but this does away with that. This is the simpler swing axle design as used by Skoda since the 1960s. Incidentally, Skoda itself has a fascinatingly long history, which I'm not going to go into in this video, but you will see some top models are called the Laurent and Clement, and that was the original company founded in the 1890s, but was purchased by Skoda, a much larger, larger company, um, as its motoring arm, and that became Skoda. So it's a very lengthy, very interesting history. It's definitely worth some of your Googling time. Hopping aboard. It's, uh, yeah, it feels a very dated interior for the 1980s, but full of charm. But one of the biggest issues that's immediately apparent is the amount of wheel arch intrusion. So the throttle is almost in line with the center of the steering column. It's not actually too tight for space. I'm glad I'm not wearing bigger shoes, perhaps. But uh, it's a bit of a shame because it detracts from what is otherwise a very pleasant driving position. All the controls fall neatly to hand. Although the controls themselves are um, uh, de definitely of a socialist nature, shall we say. Uh, one of my favourite features is the fan blower switch here. Uh, if I just pop the ignition on. Um, so it got one speed there. That's Oh no, it is just the one speed. I think it's meant to be two. And then you take it to a third position, which pushes the heated rear window on. Uh, can you just... There you go, camera lady. So we've got a heated rear window uh, illumination there. But if you don't want the fan on, you can turn the switch the other way. So what you can't do is go to the first position and have the heated rear window on. That, that's not allowed. Uh, we've got hazard light also rotates, lovely indicator noise. And uh, we've got a light control down here for the side and headlights. And then column stalks pretty much as you'd expect. Some Skodas did have very, very variable intermittent wipers. Um, where this is like the most remarkable amount of control you've ever seen for wipers. This one sadly seems to lack that. Uh, but we have got uh, an intermittent position there, I think. The gearbox is um, a little clunky uh, and imprecise, but that's hardly surprising. The gear linkage has got quite a long way to go to the gearbox behind me. But uh, yeah, otherwise it, it's a pleasant place. There's good visibility. Uh, most UK Skodas seem to have a sunroof fitted. Uh, so even that's got proudly Skoda upon it. And uh, we've got things like on the dashboard. If we come right in, I'm going to steal the camera just to say that each gauge proudly says Czechoslovakia. Jumping into the rear. Oh, it's a, it's a little bit cozy in the back uh, with a seat set for me. The knees are just into the seat. The headroom's a bit tight. It actually feels like I'm sitting quite high up. Uh, of course, I've got the engine right behind me. I've got these lovely parcel mount um, speakers. Very period correct. Look at those. Lovely. So at least um, I'll get the tunes on the way. Right, start the engine up. And it's quite peculiar, you won't be picking this up, but of course the engine noise is behind us. Uh, the important business of the windscreen wiper test. Oh, good jets, look at that. But um, I'm afraid the wipers do um, cause some concern. We have got a triangle of doom going on over here. I'll bring you over for an examination. Yeah, definite triangle of doom. Might be difficult to make out, but it is there. The passenger wiper arc does not meet the driver's wiper arc. Disappointing. But uh, we should get over that. You know, it's a cheap car. Uh, they couldn't think of everything. And uh, we'll get underway. Very distinctive noise with these Skodas. And away we go. Oh, this brings back so many memories from when I owned um, my Skoda 105 Lux back in 1998. 
And sadly, by the time I got around to owning or wanting to own another rear engine Skoda, values have gone up considerably. This one has just 15,796 miles on the clock. And sure, it could have gone round, but the overall feel of the car is that it probably hasn't. Uh, these cars tended to be bought by, shall we say, older drivers, and uh, they would use them very sparingly and look after them very lovingly, which is probably why this one is still in such lovely condition. We must watch out for cyclists. I'm not sure who'd come off worse in an accident. So the 1.2 litre engine, it's, it's not a powerhouse at all, but uh, it goes well enough. And uh, should we find some bigger roads, it should prove um, excellent at speed. But it's fairly quiet because the engine is so far away. A bit like a Volkswagen Beetle. Ooh, little bouncy over the level crossing, but uh, not too much bother. I think one thing that made these cars so good in rallying is because the weight is over the driven wheels at the back, you could get great traction out of bends, even on gravel. You just had to respect the um, rear wheel drive nature and uh, make sure you don't lift off. So being in 1989, this is right towards the end of uh, rear engine Skoda production. Uh, that finally managed to develop the favorite. Skoda had actually been pushing to develop uh, front wheel drive cars since the 60s, but uh, under the Iron Curtain, they were never allowed, they were never given the development money to do it. But uh, as things started to ease in the 1980s, they finally managed to get permission, you know, to speak to companies like Porsche and help develop the front wheel drive platform they'd always wanted. And that came at a critical time because Let's face it, with cars like the Proton appearing on the market in the late 1980s, uh, budget buyers suddenly had a very, very different choice of cars. Cars that were much closer to the Western ones. This doesn't feel like a Western car at all. Certainly it doesn't feel like a 1980s Western car, maybe a 1960s one. So very outdated and that change for Skoda came at a critical time and allowed Skoda to become the um, huge part of Volkswagen but it is today. So I haven't got a rev counter but we're doing 60 miles an hour and I'd, I'd say that's fairly comfortable. There's a bit of wind noise which you might expect because it's not exactly super aerodynamic but this feels like a very dignified way to um, drive down the road to be honest. It's not a very smooth road you may be picking up the movement but uh, the suspension is coping admirably. And that's the thing, when you look beyond the jokes, these were actually very, very decent cars. And certainly the people who bought them became very passionate, very loyal to the brand. And that was partly because of the very passionate dealer network that loved these cars as well. But uh, a lot of it comes down to the car itself. Uh, definitely one of the better cars from those um, communist days. Yeah, you're mostly struck by just how peaceful it is really you can hear the engine chattering around uh, a, a bit push rod design uh, do have a bit of um, valve train chatter but uh, i don't think that is that much of an issue here it became more of an issue on the favorite which used the development of this engine all alloy but still with the push rods and uh, because the engine is now right in front of you uh, that they um, aren't quite so pleasant to drive This is really nice and it, another ooh, another one of the problems with the favorite is the favorite is just a bit too competent really this this feels very different to western cars whereas the skoda favorite was really trying to be a western car and uh, did a very good job but of course lost so much charm in the process uh, this this feels very very different and uh, it, it's all the better for it it's also good to know that there's such a strong, passionate uh, club for these cars. Uh, the Skoda Owners Club has done a great job of dealing with the difficulty of a company that had some very, very different periods in its life. The Volkswagen era cars are so different to what came before. But yeah, I know lots of people in the club very well and uh, 
it's always been very welcoming to anything that has a Skoda badge and I think that's to its credit to be fair. It's a shame these cars were kind of effectively written off in this country by people making cheap jokes because they were cheap cars. Uh, they were far more reliable than um, people gave them credit for and uh, provided many tens of thousands of happy miles on motoring for an awful lot of families. I think certainly when it came to um, the best budget buy, I think the Skoda was deservedly at, at the top of that list. It was competing against cars like the Yugos from the former Yugoslavia, uh, the Fiat 126, which is just tiny and uh, latterly built in Poland. Citroen 2CV was often included in those group tests of cheap cars, uh, which offered uh, more practicality in some ways, but it must be said, even though I'm a 2 cv -er, this feels a lot more refined uh, from a daily use point of view. It's a lot more peaceful. And uh, yeah, much as I love 2CVs, if you just want to get the family somewhere, I think a Skoda feels like a better bet. Although if you actually want to take some eggs across a ploughed field, I think the um, 2CV would probably win that one. Also, you got the full length sunroof, so that's a lot of fun. Of course, the 2CV just feels even more ancient, being a sort of effectively 1930s, 1940s design. So while this harks back to the 1960s, uh, it's worth remembering car design in the 1960s was in a very different place. So yeah, I think it's definitely one of the best budget buys you could buy and plenty of reason to own one today. They're still great cars. So there we have it, the Skoda Estelle. Still um, an incredibly joyous classic drive. Not the fastest car, not the best handling car. Though I do know we didn't skid off the road and die, so perhaps they're not quite as bad as everyone used to make out. And as long as you respect them, absolutely fine. Uh, you can drive around normally, not a problem. So uh, yeah, very enjoyable car. So thank you very much for watching. Um, don't forget you can head to the Hubnut store and buy lovely merchandise. And uh, look forward to seeing you in a future video. Farewell. I haven't got any words yet. Come on, brain, 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 brain. One for the outtakes, yeah.